Hello, my name is Kyle Pettit. I'm with the Beresford Group. And as you know from this channel, for those that have been following us for a while, uh, we talk about all things in Colorado Springs specifically, eat, sleep, live, work, play. And I want to focus today on play. Because Colorado is just this giant outdoor playground that anybody can enjoy, literally anybody. But there's something unique about Colorado. Yes, there's mountains. Utah has mountains, so what? Montana has mountains, so what? What Colorado has that is unique from every other state that has all these mountains is that we have the most 14ers of any of them. A 14er is a mountain that is 14,000 foot or taller. We actually have like 58. That's crazy. That's a lot of big freaking mountains all over the place. And it provides, first and foremost, I'll just say this even if you don't want to walk around and hike and climb and whatever, gosh, they're beautiful. And they're so unique, they're jagged. You know, when you get to these 14ers, it's where you really shift from just being like hiking through the trees, which by the way, is like my favorite thing, but you get above the tree line. It's, it really happens between, depending on where you are, uh, are at in the state, 12,300, 12,500, somewhere around there, you pop out of the trees and then there are no more. And now it's just like boulder fields. Uh, the only plants that might be of higher, like, you know, little succulents, um, lichen, stuff like that. But you're, you're pretty much done and you're just in rock land. So we've got all these 14ers and a lot of people, I mean, people come here to train on them. Uh, people come here just to hike them. Like we often have friends that come visit and that's one of the things that we want to go do pretty much anytime that we have somebody visiting. Let's go try to crank out a 14er. So to be able to do that, I, I really don't just recommend like send it, you know, if you don't know anything. So I wanna just, in this video, and especially in the comments below, uh, or at least in the resources below, I want to provide you with some good guidance and good direction. I will just say right now, there's gonna be a lot of information. You're not gonna hurt my feelings if you put this on 1.5 speed or 2X speed, because I'm gonna be hopefully thorough so that you feel like when you walk away from this video, you feel comfortable knowing that like, all right, I at least have a starting point and I've got some resources that I can get some more information from. So the first resource that I'm gonna point you to and show here is 14ers.com. That is 14ers.com. 14ers.com is an unbelievable website. And it's really, it's like a community-based website. Um, it's free, there's no subscription. Even All Trails these days has a subscription-based service. And what, what I love about 14ers.com is you can learn so much. There are checklists, there's planning guides, there's forums. And then what you can do is you can also click on, I'm just, I'll just use Pikes Peak because it's right here in Colorado Springs and it's a big old 14er. So you can go in and you click on Pikes Peak and it shows you all the routes that are available. And it also breaks them out between class one, two, three, four, and five which I will tell you after that, uh, or after this, I'll explain what that means as well. But it breaks down that, it breaks down the commitment, and it breaks down the difficulty and the exposure. That's super important because those are like the really the big key things that you're gonna be choosing when you're looking at which 14er do I wanna go climb this weekend. Also, when you're on there, it tells you the distance, uh, you know, how many miles it's going to be, how many feet of elevation gain is it going to be. If it's your first 14er, Pikes Peak is probably not the play because the standard route on there, which is like the bar trail, it's, gosh, uh, 13 miles or something like that. Uh, somewhere between 13 and 19 miles. Like it's a, it's a freakishly long journey to get to the top of Pikes Peak that direction. So anywho, and then the last big one, which they have a, a lot of good links to it, but I'll make sure to add one down there as well. Uh, to be honest, what's probably the most important is the weather. You've got to get up to speed on what the weather is gonna be looking like. That'll be something that we cover a little bit later as well. But what is this class system? What does that mean? So class one is your basic, like I am, uh, not most national parks, to be honest, the hikes that you do in a national park, most of those are class one. 
What that means is it is a perfectly manicured trail. There's a lot of upkeep, you know, the, the amount of traffic doesn't really have anything to do with it, but it's like basically anybody can do it. That's a class one. Class two, which most of the 14ers are class two, at least, um, is you. it's a little bit of a mix. Like they're a little bit more strenuous. There's a little bit more elevation gain. Um, and you will go from like prepared trails to, I would still say they're very obvious trails, generally speaking, but it might look more like a game trail, right? Like, yes, there was a lot of traffic and so it's a very worn trail, uh, but it's not like you're walking, you know, it's got like the, the sidebars following you the whole way and it's like a perfectly dug out thing. Um, I will say, I'm gonna say this before I forget it. It is incredible to me across the state of Colorado, the way that these 14ers specifically are manicured manicured, upkept, cleaned up. Like, first of all, you almost never find trash, but that's because Coloradans are just great people and generally speaking, don't leave trash on these trails. But number two, like tree fall. It's incredible that the tree fall gets cleared super quick. Um, there are some places where you're like, it, it, you feel like you're walking up a, I walked up like a staircase of either trees or like rocks and you're like, there's no way that this like, this section, there's no way that this is natural. So I just gotta give a shout out to the Colorado like ranger, park rangers and wildlife management. And I don't actually know what the organization is, but the organization and shuns that, uh, that manage those things like, gosh, you guys are awesome. And I really love you for that. Class three, back on topic. So class three, when, you, when you're doing 14ers, it's pretty common. A lot of the 14ers get up to class three. <clears throat> class three climbing is, essentially it's at the point where you will likely need to use your hands and your feet. So like we said, you're above the tree line and, and you get to these spots, a lot of them, where it's like, it becomes a boulder field. It's almost like just a giant pile of boulders leading to the top of the mountain. And so you're using your hands for balance, you're, you kind of hop in, you're rock hopping, you're, you know, skirting around stuff, holding and, and shimmying. Um, that's class three. Class three is, um, it's harder. It's, it's sometimes a little bit scarier. Usually class three is not directly associated with exposure. Um, those two things are not, uh, they're, your class level and your exposure level are not mutually exclusive, nor are they like tied to each other. You can do class three climbing and have some like, you know, pretty good exposure. Um, but then that leads us to class four. And class four, and I do not have a good relationship if I'm being totally honest with you, but class four climbing is at that point, by definition, it means you can slash should be, I'm gonna say should, should be roped up. But it's a different form of roping up. It's like short roping. A lot of the ones that I've been on, personally, when you get to class four, the section isn't big enough, it's not long enough, it's not, it doesn't even make sense that you would short rope, but you are, it helps to have a, a few climbing skills, like that definitely doesn't hurt, like understanding the mechanics and the, the physics, you know, of, of positioning your body. It's the first time I was on a class four, I, I really didn't have that much climbing experience. Interestingly enough, what got me initially into rock climbing was because I was on Mount Lindsay. Um, yeah, it was Mount Lindsay. And there was this little, um, the, the crux or like the hardest part of the climb, you kind of go across and there's like some pretty bad exposure. And then you do some, well, now I don't know, because it was so long ago, I didn't even understand the class system. Uh, but it was at least class three, it was probably a little bit of class four climbing. And I just didn't really, like I was so uncomfortable because I didn't understand. I was like, I don't know how to rock climb. Like, where am I supposed to put my feet? Where am I supposed to put my hands? How do I keep myself safe? Now when I look back at it, I'm like, oh, that was like not even that hard. But anyway, so those two things do actually like provide a lot of uh, balance to each other. But class four, there's quite a few mountains here that do have class four climbing. A lot of the mountains, for example, will have a class two route, a class three route, and a class four route. So you got options. 
Um, I personally try to avoid a lot of the class four routes because I don't need that in my life to feel satisfied. Uh, but my fiance is quite the opposite. She likes doing that type of stuff and she's really good at it. So I just watch from afar. <laughs> Anywho, and then class five is actual rock climbing. Like you are now rock climbing. None of the routes um, listed at least on 14ers.com are like official like class five routes. But that's just in case you were curious. That's why when you go into a gym, like a climbing gym and you see climbing routes that are like, five, seven, five, eight, five, nine. That's where that five comes from. It's a five decimal and then it breaks it out from there. We are now rock climbing and now this is called technical climbing where you need a harness, you need ropes, you need gear, helmet, don't forget that. So uh, that's really, really important. Again, the other thing that we talked about that is gonna come up is so like, so which route is it? What's the distance? And then it's gonna bring up exposure. Now exposure is also a, an interesting, it's not really a topic, but it basically gives you like moderate exposure, low exposure, extreme exposure. And there are some that have extreme exposure. There is a mountain here called Capital. Look at this. This is crazy. This little thing right here in the middle is called, like as you go across from what we're looking at in this picture, this is called the knife's edge, appropriately named the knife's edge. And most people, the way that they go across it is they straddle it. They straight up put their hands on it and like scooch themselves across. Well, this photo that you just saw uh, was taken from the neighboring 13er. So this is Capitol Peak. This neighboring 13er, it's called K2. I, that is where, when I was with my group of friends, we went, we went up. You go up to K2 and then you go back down and you go across this little saddle and <laughs> you traverse across the knife's edge. Well, I stopped at K2 and uh, henceforth dubbed myself the king of K2 and gave my blessings to everybody that walked by. Nobody got hurt that day, at least from what I remember, but I just hung out. And let me also say, that's totally fine. I personally don't have a goal of finishing all 58 14ers in Colorado. Uh, some people do. In fact, one of my friends did this summer. Her name's Carly, and she's been cranking them out. She went like every weekend. She's a school teacher, um, so over the summer she had she had some time, and she was gone every weekend hitting these fourteeners. And we went with her when it made sense for us. Um, but for me, like I just enjoy being there and being up there and and hiking. And I like I like carrying a pack in. And then like we camp and then we get up early the next day and then you go up and like, I, I will try to do the whole thing, but like, I don't really have this ego that like is going to push me to a point where I just feel unsafe and I get what's called cliffed out. I've seen people get cliffed out. It ain't pretty. It's when somebody basically gets like, imagine stage fright, but on the side of a mountain and now they won't move and they're too scared. And then you got to call in a helicopter to rescue them. Don't be that person. Know your limits. 14ers are, they are about this really delicate balance of knowing your limits, respecting your limits, and pushing your limits. Yeah. Man, that should be on like a Colorado state book of 14ers like title, subtitle. Anywho, so exposure. I don't really mess with exposure. I don't like those big drop-offs that make me feel really uncomfortable. And then I just feel like unsteady. Now, there is a way to progress, and I've definitely done this, where like you progressively build up exposure. But like some of these traverses, like the Crestone Traverse, and um, like some of those, like I will never, ever do those because I just don't need to. But anyway, but if you want to, uh, there's plenty of resources in 14ers.com, the website that we've been looking at, has a lot of those resources for you. And then, so we talked about difficulty, and then the other one is commitment. And th these are all explained, but the commitment is just like, once you start this thing, you are going to need a lot of time because like, for example, on Capital, if you did not plan this thing properly and you start going across that knife's edge and then you get up and then a storm rolls in because you did really bad planning, you're probably going to be stuck. Like getting off that mountain, not going to be easy. And it's certainly not going to be quick. So, uh, 14ers.com also has an app. 
Um, and you can go in there and it's just like a much more concise place. I think obviously the website is the best place for you to go and get as much information. So when you're planning, definitely use that. But otherwise, just use the app. You can download routes, you can download photos. And that is something that 14ers.com does better, in my opinion, than all trails, is that all trails like doesn't really give you what we'll call like turn by turn of the route. It just really gives you mm, here is the route. And you get kind of that GPS like line on the topo map. But what you get in 14ers is like you'll select a route and there'll be there'll be like a picture. We'll show you some examples right here. There's like a picture and a line and it's telling you what to look for. And so like you can actually do route study, which I highly recommend. It takes the stress of route finding almost completely away. The only time that that, in my experience, has still been a factor is like in the winter. When you're doing winter 14ers, you're kind of, you kind of don't have a choice, right? Because like if there's fresh snow, you know, a lot of times those routes are going to be covered up. So it becomes really, really important to do your route study then. So let's talk about that. Winter 14ers. Whew. Winter 14ers are a bear. I've done a few. Um, <laughs> and they're great. They're, it's this own experience. There's almost nobody out there. A lot of times you have the whole mountain or it feels like the whole wilderness to yourself, which is really amazing. But one of the hard things about it, besides the fact that it's just cold, is... You, you actually have to have more gear. Like winter hikes, winter climbs up the 14ers are much more gear intensive because it's gonna be freaking cold up there. Um, even if it's a nice day, I believe it's like for every thousand feet that you go up, you lose two degrees Fahrenheit. So um, two degrees Fahrenheit, maybe it's two degrees Celsius. Now I don't even know, right? But that, that gets cold. So you climb up and you know it may be, you know, 20 degrees at the start, but you're gonna climb up 8,000 feet and that's minus 16 more degrees. So now you're in single digits. Plus, a lot of times the tops of 14ers have their own like weather systems. And so you'll have um, tons of wind whipping over those mountains. I can't tell you how many 14ers I've been on where it is honking wind, which honestly sometimes gets really scary and just really annoying because it's loud and it's just like blowing against you and you're just like turning into it and you're like, oh my gosh. But anyway, winter 14ers, uh, some of the gear that you might want to consider uh, bringing. So layers, you have your base layer, you've got your thermals, tops and bottoms, and then we'll, we'll just start at the bottoms right now. So thermal bottoms, um, truthfully, if you have really nice hard shell pants, sometimes you can just do thermals and hard shells uh, depending on what it's going to be. Um, you could also do thermals and soft shell pants. So a hard shell would be like a straight Gore-Tex. A uh, soft shell kind of has like a fleece line in them. Um, to be less technical, I mean, I'm kind of a hot body anyway, so it's less critical for me. But what I like to do is I'll wear my thermal bottoms and then I'll just wear like a nice pair of hiking pants or pants that I'll wear like hunting. They're not quite thermal, or sorry, they're not quite soft shells. Um, but like they're a little bit denser material. Um, don't be going up there in jeans. That's just a bad play. They're not flexible. It'll get really, really annoying when you start like high stepping and your knees are dragging. That's like super annoying. Um, wear good socks, preferably wool socks. They don't need to be, you know, super, super thick because you don't want these giant socks like rub in or not fitting into your boots, right? Like that's super annoying. For your top, I wear a thermal, and then what I try to do is like just baseline, I'll have my thermal top, and then I'll wear like a puffy coat, um, like, a, like a Patagonia type or a North Face type, like puffy. And then over top of that, I'll wear a hard shell, like a, like a hard shell rain jacket, because those things breathe less. And so once you, start, once you start trucking, it builds up that heat, and it just like traps it in there. And honestly, I get really, really hot, and I end up like taking layers off, because that's just me. Lauren, uh, my fiance, she's a little bit different. She doesn't stay as hot as I do. Um, but the nice thing about having proper layers and not just one big coat is like when we stop to eat snacks, I will immediately put my layers back on. Another super helpful layer is sometimes like a, really, a light fleece. Um, so it just depends on the conditions. It depends on how cold it is. And then of course, you'll probably want a net gaiter. 
um, you know, even if it's just a light wool net gaiter that you can bring up because the wind, like I was talking about, it'll get honking howling. And so that's really nice to help protect your face. Having some sunglasses. Some people just use their snowboarding goggles and that works just as well. Um, but fun story. Uh, <laughs> we kind of like unplanned went and did this winter 14 or we were going to go rock climbing, snowstorm came in. So we just kind of unplanned went and climbed Chavano, <laughs> Chavano, 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 whatever it's called. And, uh, and it was awesome. I mean, it was hard. We were not prepared. Um, I think we had gators because of the snow. So that was like, at least we were like a half step ahead on that. Um, and we had decent boots on, but we did not have snowshoes and we needed snowshoes. We were no kidding, like post holing through knee deep snow. I was not in a good way. Lauren was doing great. And truthfully, like she led most of that mountain and she was like post holing and I was just like trying to keep up. Anyway, we get up pretty high, we've got our dogs with us, and uh, we come off the mountain, and as we're driving to back to Canyon City where we were staying so we could go rock climb the next day, um, you know, she's like kind of complaining about her eyes, and, and she thought it was just that like her eyes were like kind of dried out from like the wind and whatever, and then the pain starts kicking in, and she said it felt like there was like a grain of sand in her eyeballs, and now she's like, she cannot open her eyes. We get to the hotel, she. She's like super sensitive to light. She can't open her eyes. It is not good. Do you know what I'm talking about? Old girl had snow blindness. She went straight up snow blind on me. So being the wonderful caretaker that I am, I basically had to do everything for her. I mean, she was, she was incapable of doing anything. Um, so I had to feed her, help her bathe, help her get dressed, help her lay down to go to bed, which was a terrible experience in and of itself because it was like every time she couldn't open her eyes about every 10 minutes, she would feel like the pain would like resurface. And she, it was like squirming, moaning pain, like not good. We didn't know, by the way, if that ever happens to you, that you can go to urgent care and you can get like steroid drops and that helps not only reduce the pain, but it helps, uh, reduce some of like the inflammation and actually will help heal your eyes faster. We didn't know that. So we just got like normal eye drops to try and help lubricate. But anywho, so wear your glasses. Um, that was like a really nice day too. I mean, we didn't think like, we weren't like hiking like this, like squinting the whole time and like getting really like bent out of shape about that because like, it was just pretty nice. We weren't that worried about it. So that's another really like critical piece of gear. And of course your headwear. Now I want to talk about footwear. Footwear when hiking, 14ers, is important. Winter, I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, you're probably not gonna do a winter 14er, so sorry that I spent that much time on it. But when you are going hiking on a 14er, it's probably gonna be a pretty long trip. Um, can you do it in just normal running shoes? <sighs> yes. But I wouldn't do like, I really wouldn't feel comfortable doing like class three, class four type of stuff in just like Nike freeze. Generally speaking, because they just don't have a good amount of traction for them, right? Um, but does that mean that you need hiking boots? No. Let me say that again. No, you don't need hiking boots. You just need hiking shoes. Generally, for most people, I, Lauren, all like most of our friends, our group of people, like what you see the most when you're up there is you see people wearing like trail running shoes because they're light, they're soft, but they're stable enough, right? And they've got good traction. You don't need to go, I'm gonna call out some brands, you don't need to go get Merrill boots. You don't. You don't need hiking boots. You don't need to go get Kenetrex. You don't need, you don't need Solomon hiking boots, most likely. Um, I would say the first place that I would look would be like an Ultra Timp or I mean, even Hoka makes some, uh, some trail shoes, trail, they're like running shoes, but they're just gonna be more comfortable. Now it changes if you're taking in a big pack or whatever, but you know, that's a different, that's a whole different topic. So I would really recommend like your shoe, your socks and your shoes is generally most important. 
In the summertime, you know, I'll have shorts on. I'll, I'll still carry a light jacket because it can get breezy and it can get cold or it could sprinkle. Son of a bitch. Ah. And then uh, there's some pretty decent calculations on what, like how much water you want to bring. I personally bring extra, like I bring a lot of water. I typically try to do most mountains and have um, one of those uh, bladders in my backpack that's got the little straw thing. When I first started implementing one of those into my gear list, man, it changed the way that I did mountains because like I wasn't trying to just pull out a Nalgene or a bottle or whatever to drink water. I could just like grab it, sip while still hiking or stop briefly to drink. And then what I'll do is I'll put like an electrolyte based drink into a Nalgene instead. And that way uh, I've got both, but like I've always got the access to water. I will, no kidding, typically, I mean, I'm 6'1", 210. So like, Calculate it for yourself, but I typically bring, like, I'll have at least two and a half liters of water in my bladder, and then I'll have, like, another liter of water that will be, like, an electrolyte drink. So that's, like, super important. The worst thing that could happen is that you get up on a 14er, and you just run out of gas, and you're dehydrated, and you don't have snacks, and you don't have electrolytes, and you don't have any proper gear, and then you get stuck on the top of a mountain, and then you're just in a dark place, and... You die, or they have to call somebody to come pick you up. All of those options are absolutely terrible. So bring more water than you think that you need. Bring some like high quality snacks. That'll also help you out a lot. 14ers.com, what I would recommend you do is you go in, and if you've never done any 14ers before, you can just search and just do the ones that are less difficult. There are plenty within driving distance from Colorado Springs that are very, very not difficult. In fact, Beerstadt and Evans, well, okay, Evans you can actually like drive to the top of, but you can also do that to Pikes Peak, so that doesn't count. But Beerstadt is like the easiest mountain to go up in terms of it is like the most accessible. And it's highly trafficked for a reason. There's tons of people on that for a reason. Um, but if you're just like, this is my only time in Colorado and I just want to get up a 14er and say that I was above 14,000 feet, man, get after it. That's an easy way to do it. If you want to hit both of them and you want to add a little bit of spice into your life, uh, you go up Beerstadt and then you can go down and you can traverse what's called the Sawtooth Ridge. Um, it's actually pretty fun, uh, but there are a couple parts that there, there gets to be a little bit of exposure, not like an ungodly amount, but there's some decent exposure on it. And then you climb back up and then you walk across and you finish on top of Evans. Um, so that's a way to like bang out two 14ers in one go. Um, I personally have done around 15 of them. And, and that was because of the Sawtooth Ridge, that was one of the most fun. But I will say one of the most amazing trips that I've ever been on was down in Durango. We took the train up to the Wemenuche Wilderness, hopped off the train, walked up six miles, and we went to this place called Chicago Basin. And I mean, look at these views. This place is so gorgeous. There's four 14ers up there. You can camp up there. There's mountain goats everywhere. There's marmots the size of small dogs everywhere. And then you hike up to this like second little platform area, level, I don't know what to call it. Um, and there's this area called Twin Lakes. Like look how beautiful this is. And there's four 14ers out there. That trip, and most of the 14er trips that I've been on, especially when you get to overnight, there, there's just something magical about them. These mountains are so big and they're so, so difficult because the air gets really thin and you think that you're fit and then you find out that you're not as fit as you thought you were. Um, but it just becomes, you know, climbing a mountain is like, it's one of the greatest metaphors for life in general, in my opinion. Um, you know, you're just like, sometimes you're just, sometimes you're just like one step at a time, literally. Sometimes like you're so focused on how far, as cliche as it sounds, it's like, oh my gosh, I have so much further to go. And then like you turn around and you look where you came from and you're like, wow, I guess I didn't realize like, man, I've gone a long way already. There's so many little metaphors um, 
one of the things that I do when I'm hiking and I get into a really dark spot because like I am just tired and I'm hurting or I'm climbing up something really, uh, really just physically strenuous. <laughs> this is kind of weird. I will find little crops of rocks, like a little group of rocks, and I'll look at the rock and I, <laughs> I will sing to myself and I'll go, baby rock, do, 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 baby rock, do, 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 do. And I'll just work through the whole family of rocks until I get to that outcropping of rocks. And it's like mindless and mind numbing and nonsense, but it kind of takes my pain off. It, it takes my mind off the pain a little bit and, and we just work our way up. So I really, really encourage you, if you have the opportunity to come out to Colorado and spend any amount of time out here, it is worth it is absolutely worth spending a day or two trying to get up one or two 14ers. It's really, really incredible. Like I said, I'll leave some resources down below. Um, I'll leave you guys like what, I, honestly, I'll just copy and paste and like show, give you guys a link to our packing list, what we use. Um, I'll also leave you the 14ers.com where there's route planning tools, there's trip plannings, there's trip reports of people that have gone in the last week or two or day. Um, I'll leave you the weather service place that we use the most often. Um, I don't have any like affiliate links for gear or anything, but, uh, you'll kind of see in, in our gear list, some of the things that we've found helpful and important and useful. So, um, and then of course, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, easiest way to get a hold of me is probably through Instagram at KJ Pettit. Um, and, uh, you know, if, you listen to this and you come and you climb one of those 14ers and it was just the most magical experience and you decide that you want to move to Colorado. I am a full-time licensed realtor. That's what I do. Uh, I do that generally speaking so that I have the free time to go climb mountains when I want to and when the opportunities provide themselves. But um, very happy to help you make the transition and make the move to Colorado if that's a thing that you're looking to do. Um, I am an expert in buying and selling real estate. And I want to help you do that if that's something that you have interest in doing. Uh, the number to get a hold of us is right here. Our links are down below as well. You can follow us on the socials. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. Share this with your friends. I know it was a long video, but I hope that there was some value. If you've had zero experience, maybe at least you have an idea of how to go about this in the future. Thanks for watching and uh, love you. Bye.